And it's a part of your transcript already too. Okay, so what we're talking here today, this is one that I put together a, a pretty good little while back. And um, what I want to do is um, get this thing, I ought to get Tim to wire it, hook this up where it'll talk to that again. Like, you know, top of that. When an engine is running right, the bearings, the valve train, the rings, and the cylinder walls are healthy. That means that you got round holes and you got the pistons going up and down in there. And they're the nice thing, you know, as they, as they get old, they sort of get egg shaped and they get tapered and they get to where they don't seal good every, every part of the cylinder. The cam and crank are spinning in time. If the cam and crank aren't in time, the valves aren't opening like they're supposed to because an engine is basically a breathing machine anyway. And the spark is strong and the spark plugs are clean and not excessively worn. Okay, so. That's basically the first little preamble there. That's an excessively worn spark plug right there. Okay, so let me get my yard stick. Should be running about 200 degrees. A cold running engine is not efficient. Back in the day, in the 60s and 70s, everybody felt like colder was better. If it was just bone cold, they just loved it. But a cold running engine is not efficient, it ain't healthy, and it's gonna wear out a heck of a lot quicker. It needs to run about 200 to 210 all the time. Now occasionally you'll see one that's uh, running, if it gets much over, do you know what temperature the fan comes on on these GM cars when, they, when, they, when the radiator cooling fan comes on, you know what temperature is? On those? Actually, the two, if you look it up, it's 228. The <laughs> fan doesn't come on until 228. So, you know, that seems like excessive to me, you know what I mean, and some of these little four-cylinder escorts. People will be terrified because it would get... Even on a brand new car, it would get really up close to the hot before it, the fan came on and it fluctuated back and forth. So oil has got to be clean and not contaminated. Also, when somebody starts an engine and they just start it for a little bit and switch it off, and just to make sure it stays limbered up, later on they sludge it up so bad, there it's just, you know, and at, at places where they do a lot of work, if an engine is completely sludged up, they'll just replace the engine instead of cleaning the sludge out, because by the time you clean the sludge out, you got a lot of labor in it, they just pull a motor in it. The oil is clean, not contaminated, the fuel system delivered like it should, and there's good clean airflow. The oil can get contaminated with gasoline if it's gone a long time without an oil change. So basically, you can basically have uh, a situation. Let's say that you're, one of the things that we used to be told to do by the uh, stuff at Ford was whenever we had one that was, uh, there was a rich condition that was causing it to go lean, right? So what they would tell us to do when you're troubleshooting that, one of the first things they wanted you to do was pull the uh, PCV valve out and cap it off so there was no vacuum getting in there and see if whenever you did that it normalized, the oxygen sensor normalized. And if it did, then you needed to change the oil. And a lot of times you'd find that. you find that somebody's gone too far without changing the oil and it wound up getting contaminated with fuel. All right, so uh, the fuel system should be delivering the Fuel pressure is not anything that's standard from one vehicle to the next. The old uh, uh, throttle body injected uh, Ford, I mean, excuse me, uh, General Motors trucks and all would run about 12 PSI. And the strange thing about those is when the fuel filter was stopped up on one of those old TBI trucks, it would feel like the catalytic converter was stopped up. So if you drive one of them old TBI trucks and it's going, oh, 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 and you're thinking, oh, that exhaust is stopped up because it kind of feels like it, you better be thinking about that. The problem with those is it's a little aggravating to check the fuel pressure. You got to take the fuel line loose from the fuel filter and, and tee in there. You know, there are tools for that. But anyway, long and short of it is uh, it's easier to pull a fuel filter off and try to blow through it. If you can't blow through it, put one on it. Fuel filter don't cost that much. It ain't that hard to change on most of them unless it's inside the tank, which it is what's on now. You not, you've got to know what the fuel pressure is supposed to be though. Uh, on that little Ranger out there, when uh, uh, you know, whenever we were using it, it was like 75, 80 pounds of what it was supposed to have. Uh, most of them, you know, run between 40 and 60 PSI. Unless it's gasoline direct injection, then it's going to have a, you know, a pump that's feeding a high pressure pump. The high pressure pump will run, you know, 500 to 4,000 pounds or whatever those run, you know. Uh, all right, so out of time. If it's out of time, a two for two, late valve timing causes low engine vacuum, surging, and poor fuel economy. And uh, if you've got a MAP, you know, mass airflow, I'm sorry, manifold absolute pressure system that's primarily speed density, and you're running a late at valve time, and you're going to have low vacuum, and you're going to have black smoke, and you're going to have fuel trim screwed up because of valve time in itself. Um, I drove one time there was a, you know, see this right here shows the time of valve, it's got some missing teeth. Uh, I drove this Toyota one time, it was a, 
like the engine out there is an 87 Toyota Camry and my uh, neighbor had it and he wanted me to look at it because it wasn't running right and I drove it all the way to Dothan and wrote up a ticket on it over at the Ford place and I took that thing down and it had jumped three teeth. There was three teeth shelled off that thing and I drove it all the way to Dothan. It could have jumped time anyway, you know, I don't know why it didn't put miraculous there. But anyway, um, now everybody remembers on the engine repair aspect of it or if you're doing engine performance work, what's the best way to find out if one is in time on a time and belt vehicle? The quickest way you can find out if it's in time. Like on a little Toyota engine or whatever. Anybody remember that? Line the camshaft timing markup. Ignore the crank to start with. Line the camshaft timing markup. When that camshaft timing mark lined up, the crank mark ought to be lined up every time. If you're using a crank mark, the camshaft may be lined up every it's gonna line up every other time. But if you want to just, you know, go ahead and bring it around until the cam is lined up and then you ought to see the crank perfect. If it's not, then you got you need to fix that. Also, if you see an engine that hits 100, and like if, if you look at like on some of the little uh, uh, Kia uh, Cepheus and all that stuff, if it tells you to change the timing belt at 108,000, you darn sure better change it because if you go to 110,000, it's probably going to jump. And if it jumps, it bends valves and breaks the heads off of them and busts the motor off. You don't have to put a motor in for the if it jumps time. And some people that ignore that timing belt change in it will get in big trouble like that. And let me ask you this, when you put a timing belt on one, on, you know, they got square teeth and they got round teeth on timing belts. And um, I think it's the round teeth, I always forget which one it is. But some of them, when you tighten it up too tight, the belt will make a noise. The timing belt's too tight, it'll make a noise. It'll go, yeah, you know, a noise that it's not supposed to be making. Then you got to go back and loosen the timing belt a little bit if you over tighten it. You don't want it too loose where it's slapping the cover either. There's a girl that came in here one time, she had this little SUV she was driving, and she had us checking something else. And I said, the timing belt slapping the cover on your little, whatever it sounds like, with a little Kia something, or my man's Sportage. And uh, she says, oh, okay. And so I said, well, I'm going to go ahead and order a timing belt, and uh, bring it back in here tomorrow, and we'll pop a timing belt on. The timing belt's only $35, and it wasn't hard to change. Uh, no problem, I'll do that. She just didn't do it. Well, about, uh, and I sent the timing belt back and all that stuff. Well, about, uh, a month later, she came in here and she says, uh, about three weeks after I didn't bring my car in here, it jumped time when I turned it into Walmart. It cost me $1,500 to get the vent valves. <laughs> I mean, she listened to me, say, but no. All right, if you line the cam time enough, the crank should be in time every time. That's just the way it is. If you line that one up, that one will be lined up. That one, this one could be over here. You know, that's what I was getting at. All right, so if you line the cam time it up like this right here, you know, whenever you line it up, just make darn sure. Uh, I don't want to beat a dead horse on that. Contaminated engine oil. This is, my, uh, <laughs> this is a little story I like to tell about my, my mom's Chrysler. All right, so uh, the engine oil can be contaminated with fuel as it steams out of the oil and pulls into the PZV system and all that. My dad uh, called me and said there was a, light, a power loss light or whatever it was came on that car. I said, turn the key on three times, see what the code flashes out. He was ain't fooling with that nonsense. So I went over and turned it on three times, got a code 17, I said it needs a thermostat, he can like do that, he puts a thermostat in it. And then about two or three weeks later, after that code went away, he decided he was going to change oil, so he changed oil and he called me up and he goes, all it did is change oil, now it won't idle. Because the oil, it was running too cold, oil was contaminated with gas, as the pull battery cable off for a little bit, put it back on, he goes, now it idles just fine. So I mean, I basically figured that, figure that one out over the phone. Alright, so here we got the Bronco here. Uh, now. This thing right here was a, uh, is a Bronco like one of yours, about like yours. It was brand new at the time when I was in the dealership. And this boy brought it in there and he says, um, I mean, the guy that was working across from me doing drivability work, he cranked it up and it would, uh, and when it was cold, it would sputter and pop and go dead. Mm -hmm. And then he kept the fool play with the gas. If he warmed it up, it went okay. But every time he started the darn thing cold, it would sputter and pop and cut up and go dead. And this thing was nearly new. I mean, it didn't even have 5,000 miles on it. And, uh, and he worked, 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 worked on that thing. He checked everything twice. He cleaned the injectors. He did all kinds of stuff. He couldn't get nothing to work. And so uh, he says, I don't want to do this thing. I says, I want you to do this. I want you to go out there and ask the customer, what kind of gas are you burning? I said, don't ask any leading questions on, other than just saying, what kind of gas are you burning? And I said, I'm just about to guarantee you they're going to say we're burning premium gas. So they said, okay. They went out there and said, what are you burning in there? Best gas we can put in there, premium gas. They said, okay, that's your problem. 
So if you put premium gas in there, it burns slower. This thing's tuned to run on 85, 87 octane. If it says 87 octane, put 87 octane in it, or it's going to, you know, carve it up the combustion chamber, and then 87 octane is all you'll be able to use. All right. So premium fuel burns more slowly, and if the engine's calibrated to run on regular, then premium fuel can cause stumbles when the engine's cold. Chrysler and Ford have got technical service bulletins about that. Don't put 93 octane in it if it's set up to run on 87. Now, the president of the college got a tuner, had me put these yellow coils in his Lincoln, and he used his tuner to set it up to run on premium, and he also made a tune the transmission to shift like a police car. <laughs> and so he comes over and says, let me take you right on my Lincoln. So he takes me up the road and, whoo, you know, throws my head back against the seat, you know, you know. He didn't spin the tires, but he, he's, a, he's a character. All right, so weak spark, quarter of an inch is not enough. I've talked about that before. I always, for years and years, I didn't have a spark tester in my box. I'd use a pocket screwdriver. You know what I mean? And so, now, the thing about it is, if you use a pocket screwdriver like this, and this hole goes all the way through, and you happen to be anywhere near, you know, the little crack in there. So what I always like to do is I like to stick the spark plug in the hole. 35, 40 PSI right now. All right. And I'm, I'm happy with that. If I see it go below 25, I'm going to be bothered. Okay. Well, I'll keep on. Uh, keep an eye on it. So I'm going to pull the plug wire off. And I'm going to push this up in there where it's on there, and I'm going to hold it by the plug wire, close to metal. And then I'm going to let it, I'm going to let it start popping at about a quarter inch, and I'm going to see if I can stretch it. And that will be, it'll scare the daylights out of you. It'll be an inch long for you're afraid it's going to eat you alive. <laughs> because that's what you're supposed to have if you're going to have a good, strong spark. On the coil pack, uh, do the test from one tower to its companion for the best results. Uh, that's, you know, like on some of the Chrysler, like a, these little Dodge Neon, stuff like that. If you're just trying to jump it to the block, you may not show a very strong spark, but if you try to jump it to its companion, you'll get a good strong spark. See, that's the point. All right. And so spark wires leaking spark. What you're going to do, what I used to do whenever I was working on one that had a, you know, distributor on it, like, like the Bronco, like you got, uh, first thing I'd do is I'd go out there and I'd spray uh, soapy water all over the plug wires. And when you do that, if it starts skipping, back, 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 like that, oh, I'm going to find the one that's leaking the spark. Put a plug wire on it, you're good to go, or put a set on it. At the Ford place, we just had single plug wires. Most of the time, it didn't need a lot of plug wires, and somebody had been fooling with it, pull the ends off of it. All right, so this kind of leak, it just starts skipping. Now, sometimes when you're spraying it and you're in a dark place, you may, it may not start skipping, but you may see some little orange fire. That don't mean you need to replace nothing. If it starts skipping, that's the trigger. You know what I mean? That's what you're wanting. Also, you can take a test lap, like that one right there, hook it up the ground, put it in the negative side of the coil, and if it's making a bright pulsing, woo, 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 you can just illustrate it on yours by hooking a test light up and letting it flicker on that tack side, and when you pull a plug wire off, you'll see a, a big, bright, strange pulse. That means when I would do that, if I, if I did that and I didn't see a pulse, if I saw it just a flicker but not a poof, 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 I would snap the throttle, and if it stumbled, I knew it needed spark plug. Instantly. I mean, on, that's on the E-Core coil stuff and all that kind of stuff. And that's what I did on those Ford things. Always have a look at the plugs. If it's a misfire, have a look at the one that's misfiring and find out which cylinder is misfiring first. When you pull the plug out, lay them in order. Don't just throw them on the bench. Because all of a sudden, oh crap, i got a problem here. Now, which cylinder, which plug went to which cylinder? You know, all these people who do race cars, they have a funky little thing up here where they can just set the plugs that are numbered. You know, it's a little L-shaped thing with holes in it. That's always there, bolted up to the bulkhead. And they'll, when they pull the plugs out, they put that one where that one came from, that one where that comes from, because that's their life plug and all that. Now, I don't have the money to run a race car because basically, if you're going to blow your engine up and spend $5,000 building another, blow it up again, spend another $5,000 building another one, that's a, that's a money pit, is what it basically is. The chances are everybody else out there is going to be faster than you, so you ain't going to win a bunch of money every time you race. You know what I'm saying? There's always somebody faster. All right, spark plug center electrode resistance is supposed to be no more than 8,000 ohms. Uh, the champion spark plug, people don't like it when you say that, but whenever you go, I went to a Ford Advanced Engine Performance School, on the you know, they had something running kind of like a lectude that we had to do up there that was Ford. They actually had a picture, and I can pull it up somewhere and show you, of you measuring the center of electrode with spark plugs, and it ought not be more than 8,000 ohms. If I put that in a motor rager, I'm going to champion spark plug by sending me a scathing email about that. So that's stupid. You're supposed to use a scope to spark plug. You can get champion spark plugs, all due respect to champion, 
and sometimes I put champions back in a Chrysler or something if that's what it came in. But I've measured though, a brand new set of champions and seen them go from 2,000 to 17,000 in the same set of plugs. They're just all over the map, you know. Uh, now, anyway, uh, this resistant on coil pack systems, you'll see these, see these little lines. I don't know if I might mark it with a pencil, don't it? Looks like somebody, but basically that was spark jumping that did that. Spark jumping down the outside. The resistance in the plug gets a little too high, jumps down the outside. You know the, the tune-up grease that you put in the spark plug boot, you know what that's for? You know the little white tune-up grease we got that looked kind of like almost like snot? You put it in there and you snap it back on there. What's the purpose in that? Anybody know? A lot of people don't know. Well, yes, it's also not just that, uh, but oxidation is going to, well, you got ozone in there. It's being made every time the spark jumps. But the other thing is, you don't want to spark a naked spark. And that dielectric grease doesn't conduct electricity at all. So when you snap it on there, you're filling up the little gaps in there or where the little, where it snaps on the plug. And that makes the spark only go where the, uh, where the metal's touching instead of finding little places to jump. Because where you've got a naked spark, you've got RFI. What's RFI? All right, Mr. Military Man, you should know that. Radio frequency interference is what you got on that. We used to take when we were troubleshooting something, and then we were taught to do this back in the day, turn the AM radio all the way to the low end of the band where it's really, really sensitive to that kind of thing. Drive it down the road whenever the engine starts cutting up. See if you're hearing funky spark popping noises in the radio static. Works really good. You got your little diagnostic tool right there on the car. AM radio all the way to the low end band. You know, the, the uh, uh, fighter pilots back in uh, the Vietnam War had a low-end AM radio so that when they got painted with radar, they could make all, they'd make all that squawking noise and hear all their blood. They'd know that uh, they needed to do, you know, dodge the sound that was being shot at them and all that kind of thing. But uh, that low end of that thing is really, it's really susceptible to interference. Now, octane booster can create red, dusty-looking deposits like that right there, and they cause erratic spark and surging. Um, basically, my brother had a uh, 71 Thunderbird with one of those 375 horsepower 429s in it, and he would put an octane booster in it. And after a while, it started running crappy. And so I pulled the spark plugs out, and this is what they look like. Old red dusty stuff. All right, this particular set of plugs here came out of a Mustang that this guy had, had 11,000 miles on it, it was running bad. We pulled the plugs out. And all of that was on the plug. And you see how that spark had been jumping to the side? Because this uh, oxide dust is kind of conductive. And it basically fouls the plugs to the point where the car doesn't run right. And an octane booster will do that. Now, I'm not saying every brand of octane booster does it, but the ones I've seen will do it. Now, make sure the plugs are all the way in when you're going to those deep wells. This one right here was one I took a picture of. There was a uh, van that we used to have. And you might even remember it if you've been around here a long time. as a uh, it was a 6.8 liter V10 Ford van, and uh, it blew the spark plug out in one of the holes. Well, one of the guys that worked here bought the van when they opened it off, and he came up here and they had blown the plug out of the hole. So I had to get up in there, and you're working up in the, under this doghouse, and you're way up in here where the stupid spark plug is. And so what we do, we turn the engine over to her, and we blow air into the throttle body until it's coming out the spark plug hole, right? Then we get our 14 millimeter one and a quarter thread tap. Because the plugs aren't, I mean, the threads aren't damaged bad enough to where they need to be helicoiled or sleeved, but you can't get the plug to screw back in there because the threads have got just enough of a screw. So you want to run that tap down in there, you know, and feel all the, that stuff coming out. So what you can do, let's say you're working out in the backyard and you're tapping out the spark plug thread, right? And you don't want those filings going down in the motor. How are you, you going to get it out? You ain't got an air compressor. I'm going to put a whole bunch of grease on the tap. Does that work? Because the filings get caught in the grease, right? You can do it that way too. Long and short of it is, I run the thing down in there, and then when I put the plug in there, I didn't know if it was going all the way in there or not. And it's down in a hole, and you're up in a, you know, in a cavern, and you're going down in a hole like this. So I put Prussian blue, that's what that Prussian blue stuff is. It doesn't say red, that's not Russian blue, it's Prussian blue, okay? And you can buy it at the parts store, made by Fermatec. Put it on there, screw it in, and if it's going all the way down, you'll see that it's marked it. See, that's see what I did with that plug right there. That's a good way to do that. And I don't just, and I tell you something else too. I have actually seen people do this where they just throw a plug down in the hole and then put the socket down there and kind of be a bi. Well, if you ding that first thread, 
Now you've made a lot more work for yourself. So start it with something that'll hold the plug. Now what I don't like is in spark plug sockets that holds the plug so tight that whenever you go to pull the spark plug, pull the extension out of the, it, the stupid socket stays down in there. You know what I'm saying? So I'm gonna basically take a piece of the 3 8 uh, fuel hose and I screw the plug in there. You start it with your fingers. You can't cross thread it with a piece of 3 8 fuel hose. You're just not going to. You know what I mean? It's gonna find the place it needs to go. But a curved piece of 3 8 fuel hose don't work good. You need to get one that you've trained to be straight. And uh, you know, I'll put that little piece on the end of a screwdriver or whatever too. All right, fuel pressure is important. Uh, if the fuel pump runs a key on, you know the PCM's awake and working. We talked about that repeatedly. Uh, so the fuel pressure should hold steady and not drop off when the pump run is done. When the pump kicks off, that pressure should stay locked within a pound or two of that. If it starts falling off, then it's either going back through the pump or it's going through an injector into the engine or the fuel pressure regulator is bad or something like that. This is really important stuff, so don't forget that. Alright, so here we have fuel pressure being tested with this device here, this digital, this digital, digital transducer. We got it. It's true fuel pressure, and here we've got it on the scan tool. And you see, there's about 10 pounds difference when the vacuum line is plugged into the rail pressure sensor. I got it in reverse. Watch what it does when I break for it. See how the fuel okay, pressure, up, fuel pressure is going way down. It's truthfully reporting from the fuel rail pressure sensor, and here I am with. I'm having to recover, so you can have to push the air out of the fuel rail. All right, we're going to start with a fuel filter. We probably got a bad fuel pump in this car. Problem here, and what we got? The car. We got all the vacuum. The vacuum hose hooked up to the fuel pressure regulator. We got 35 pounds. Right. All right. So in order to smoke down this problem, we got to pull the vacuum line off the fuel pressure. Now we got 45 pounds. You can pull the vacuum yeah. line off the pressure jumps up to When we snap accelerate, that's a bad fuel pump. I don't know how many times I would see a motorhome come in there that had 80 gallons of gas in, a, in the tank. They just filled it up, and I would take the engine cover off and put my fuel pressure gauge on it, and I'd pop that fuel pressure regulator vacuum hose off so it would jump up to 40 pounds. You snap the throttle if the pressure drops and the filter's already been replaced, you need to put a pump in it. And here's 80 gallons of gas, and it's like, we have nothing over to put 80 gallons of gas in it. You know, so I had to devise a way of bringing, drop them lower them 80 gallon gas tanks and all that. Now, understanding the big picture, something has to tell a PCM when the engine's spinning and how fast, that's the crank cam position sensor, and that's used for ignition and fuel injection purposes. Older systems use the distributor pickup for that. And so basically that's what you got there. All right, and there's your old, this right here is an optical distributor. Basically, it's got a, emitters and detectors on either on the, above and below that disc. And you see the little, the, all the little around there. A lot of make up those dirt things with a laser or something. I don't know how they do that. Um, all right, so the crank sensor alone can't tell us if which electronic fuel injected engine, which cylinders on TDC. The cam position sensor does that. Uh, now, that's, a, uh, that's the same deal. We'll, we'll, we'll go there. All right, the cam sensor will prevent some vehicles from starting. Others don't care if it's got a cam sensor or not. Most of your Ford vehicles, if the cam sensor is disconnected, the ones I've been familiar with, it will go ahead and start up, usually. All right, but on the, these Nissan Altimas, it may start and it may not. Uh, on a, if it's a V6 Nissan, uh, if, you if one of the cam sensors is bad, it'll start hard. It'll spin a long time or something like that. So if you're getting a PO340 code, Go after your cam sensor because a lot of times you may see a symbol. You know, that's what I was just talking about right there. All right, so with key on, the engine controller looks at barometric pressure, closed throttle position, engine coolant, intake air temperature sensor. Those are the four primaries. And then your ignition, so you get your fuel pump when you first turn on the key. We need fuel pump runs. All right, on a mass or a map or map, if they got ready, see this is still going through there. You got your valve timing, O2 or air fuel, evap control monitor, catalyst monitoring, throttle control, EGR and the fan. See, here's your inputs and outputs. AC compressor, go ahead and memorize this right quick so I'm gonna give a pop test on it tomorrow morning. Okay, transmission shifts, uh, control pressure, misfire monitoring is going in there, fuel pump, fuel injector, so on and so forth. All that stuff is basically being handled by the, uh, there's foreground and background managers and all kinds of stuff in the engine controller. 
and so on and on it goes. That's driving down the road, you got that. All right, when the check engine light comes on, this is always an emissions related code. And a code we store doesn't mean the oil needs to be changed, doesn't mean the coolant's low. I've had people say, My check engine light's on, and I've checked the oil and the coolant, and everything seems fine, you know. Uh, if the oil is contaminated with fuel, it can cause that. If the thermostat's open too soon, it can cause that. Uh, if, the fuel, first, if it's running too cold, it'll turn on check engine light because that's an emission problem. Now, on well, the 2011 Ranger has 600 possible diagnostic code loads. That's Joey's truck. You remember the one that Charles put the uh, uh, ball joints on the other day? That's not counting the codes that can be stored by the other module. This is how many codes you got right here. That many codes. So you need to memorize all those codes from that little list I got right there, and I'll be giving you a test on those tomorrow morning. All right. Now, we've actually seen this before, but look at this right here. Notice how these codes are laid out. Air fuel, fuel injectors, ignition or miss power, auxiliary emission control. That's your number right here. That's this number right there. This right here, if it's a 1, it's a generic. If it's, I mean, no, your final exam, you're going to see this. So you better be thinking about this and paying attention. If you see a 1 right there, it's an OEM code. Can you remember the letters OEM in caps? Can you remember that? If it's a one, it is only on code. If it's a zero, it's generic. And remember, every engine controller's got two rooms in it. So you need to look in both rooms whenever you're serious about trying to fix one. Look in your OBE generic room, look in your other room too. You can look at live data in both places. Live data in the in the OE, I mean, the generic room won't look the same always as it does in the, the enhanced room. These are your different codes. Vehicle area, body, chassis, powertrain, and network. Why they use new for, U for network, I do not know. I would have put an N there, wouldn't you? They didn't do that. And this right here finally tells you where the trouble is. All right. <clears throat> Look at that. Air fuel right there, code type. Map sensor voltage too high. See that right there? There's your air fuel system right there. And you notice it's a powertrain code. You can, you can look at that. All right. Now then, you got, look at that one, two, fuel injectors, fuel pump drivers, module secondary circuit, whatever. All right, so look at that one there, PO401. Uh, so four is auxiliary emission control, which is your EGR and your catalyst and that kind of thing. Also your evaporative system. Uh, so remember that. Don't forget this stuff. All right, and uh, that right there, see, I've got this thing coming up here too. All right, and... Uh, I don't know if I did anything. Did I even change it that time? PO2, PO203. See that? And yeah, that's O3 injector circuit open. So you're going to see fuel injectors if that's a 2. And it's a generic code and all that. All right. I think I actually have to hit it twice to make it happen, so I'm not in the same place. P1709. All right. So look there. Transmission, transaxle. Part neutral position switch out of range. If that's a seven, you're looking at a transmission code. You got it? Can you remember that? All right. So if you don't understand the codes and what sets them, you can't fix much of nothing. Find out what can cause it to set. You'll typically find a little legend here telling you what that code is, what it means, and what it takes to set it. That is a really good thing you need to know whenever you're going to be looking at some kind of a code that you're chasing. Anybody got any questions about that? Were you bored out of your skull? Were you no. going? Were you turning into a skeleton? Yes, All right, yeah, so. All right then that sounds good. So now, some of the stuff that you're going to see on your engine, on your electude final, you can draw from this. And I'll know if you were paying attention or not by how good you do on your electude final. Right? All right. So because I wrote the electude final, and, and I can do that because I'm right now the boss. Okay. <laughs> so uh, anyway, you guys. Uh, now everybody, is everybody ready? Anyway, is there anything you don't understand that I need to help you with? Probably. Huh? Probably. <laughs> now everybody is, everybody, we're going to try to, uh, this afternoon we're going to try to get ready to get through with the rest of our electrical finals for the ones of you guys that are here. And then we're going to, we're going to plow into some uh, engine performance finals and all that. And if I feel like you guys really have a little bit of a handle on what you're doing, maybe you won't have to do quite so many engine performance finals to survive. you got five electrical finals that we're doing. Do you like having five electrical finals? Would you rather have one and fail the one? That's not a good plan, is it? If you got five and you bomb on one, you should still make an 80 if you do good on the rest of them, right? That's why I like to get more than one final and all that. Um, i got one guy over there at uh, Geneva, and that character uh, 
hasn't come to class as much as he could, and he couldn't even use an owl indicator and all that. And he's trying to take it his final, you know, what kind of a grade am I supposed to give you if you don't even know how to use a dial indicator and you're working on break, you know what I'm saying? All right, so Charles, how nice of you to join us.